Hello, friends. That soaring tune you just heard was Come With Voices Singing, written by Dave Wiesler, to a dance that uh, Joseph Pimentel wrote with the same name. So I'm Jenny Beer. I'm stepping in tonight as guest interviewer for the Historical Tea and Dance Society's Five Things. On our team here, we have Lindsay Verbal, who is assisting with the program and handling all the media and all of our last minute, oh my gosh, are we live on Facebook? Dan Vilter, who usually is really in the background, but tonight is doing a lot of the things that Darlene usually does. Thank you, Dan. Reed Wilson is monitoring Zoom for questions and posting things in the chat. And Larry Hansen is doing the same on Facebook. So we encourage you to um, post lots of questions and in both in the chat boxes and we'll get to them either during the talk tonight or in the after talk and make sure you stick around for the after talk uh, the link will be posted on the friends page of facebook or in the registration email if you have your email with you um, before we move on i want to just also give a shout out to karen axelrod in that uh, <clears throat> very amusing session she just had i'm not going to give anything away but if you are a musician and it's not Christmas yet, and you might want to watch it the day after Christmas. <laughs> so, I'm Jenny Beer, and you're probably wondering, why am I here tonight? Let me uh, scoop my notes down here. You're wondering why I'm here tonight. Um, Darlene is alive and well, don't be worried. So back in the late spring, uh, Darlene and I were having a conversation about how to increase the variety of people on the show. And I said, what about dance organizers? They have kind of a different slant on things. And she started talking. And I was blown away. I had no idea how many things Darlene and her crew were doing in the Pasadena and LA area. And I said, hmm, well, Darlene, you know, if you want me on five things, I'll do it, but only do it if you let me interview you next and turn the tables. So I lied, of course, because I would have come on five things anyway. I would have been honored to be asked. But she agreed, and so that's what we're going to do tonight. And I, oops, sorry. I want to read the bio to you that was written by her team because her team knows her a lot better than I do. So Darlene Hamilton has a great passion for tea, for teacups, and for all things Disney. She is the warm heart at the center of the historical dance and tea and dance society, much the way Mickey Mouse is the heart of Disneyland. Darlene does a prodigious amount of work for the society, everything from sweeping to making soup. Her genius for themed events and general fund has, fun has made the Heritage Tea and Dance Society unique, drawing in newer and younger dancers in a way that other groups only wish they could. Darlene knows when Emma turned three, how much gold the Mahus spend each day, and she even knows where the key to the cellar is. She probably even knows what's inside it. She organizes, she teaches, she calls, um, she designs events, she choreographs, she begs, she borrows, she cooks meals for everyone, and she can tell you the square footage of any potential dance hall in the entire Pasadena area. For some reason, Ms. Hamilton loves giving herself more and more work to do. She is now working about 27 hours a day on a variety of dance themed projects and consuming enough tea to keep the Chado Tea Company in business indefinitely. Darlene has a genius for color and design and an affection for cats. She is loyal, kind, hardworking, and good tempered. She created this groundbreaking Five Things series a combination of oral history project and a community gathering place for us, for the whole international ECD community, and helping us all to weather the panic of the pandemic of 2020. Her name is now famous around the ECD world. Please welcome to Five Things, their Five Things' very own special Darlene Hamilton. <laughs> 
Hi, Darlene. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Boy, does this feel weird. <laughs> <laughs> I've transported to your place. It's very nice. <laughs> So I know you have a lot to say. Should we just jump right in? Sure. Right. Here's thing one. Where do you call home? Well, I grew up in Massachusetts and I had no clue about English country dancing when I lived there. What a shame. I was always an artist, always had the dancing gene in me and the costuming urge and as a very young girl, I was in community theater since my parents were as well. I moved to California in 1978, and then in 1985, I discovered the Renaissance Fair, which led me to Walter Nelson and the social dancer regulars who founded the Grand Victorian Ball in Pasadena. Uh, that was pretty amazing. It is still pretty amazing. I did that for about 10 years and then moved on for about another 10 years into some other pursuits. I did quite a bit of swing dancing. In about 2007, probably, a friend in the swing community came in just all aglow and raving saying, I had to do this new thing. I had to come and do it. She knew I was going to love it. And of course, it was the Grand Victorian Ball. So uh, off I went joyfully to go back and check it out again and dance at that lovely, lovely ball. Um, once I went back, I knew my love for the historical dance uh, was real. I knew I loved this beautiful music and these wonderful group dances. And uh, now I suppose I'm best known for being the founder and the organizer of the Historical Tea and Dance Society. Um, so let's chat for a minute. Who creates the dance? The musicians who write the music and have worked all their lives learning to play that music and the hours perfecting it for performance. The choreographers who study moving to the music and create dances so that we move in ways that bring us joy and emotion to the music. The people who compile the notes and the books filled with sheet music and dance notation and then those that get it out there in the world through publications and websites. The callers that research dances new and old, study and learn how to teach the dances, create the programs, study and learn how to put them all together so you have the best evening for the dancers. The organizers that manage the hall, the event, make sure they can pay for the hall, <laughs> announce and advertise the dance, make all the pieces come together, the musicians, the callers, the attendees, the snacks, the water and everything else. The logistical people who haul the needed stuff show up early to set up the hall, stay late to make sure the hall is put back to place perfectly. The sound technicians who work to create beautiful sound. The helpers who come early or stay late to lend a hand or maybe they skip a dance or two to help out with snacks. There are hundreds of hours that go into putting on a dance just for the joy of the dancing and the community. I wanted to mention all that because when I came back into historical dancing about 12 years ago, I truly was blessed to have the idea in my mind that I should probably do something more to contribute to something I love so much. And it really has changed my life. Thank you, Darlene. <laughs> Sorry to cut in on you. Uh, we're getting some requests for you to turn your mic volume up. Would you mind doing oh, that really sure. quick? Thank sure. you. Funny things happen after the uh, after the yes. setup time, don't they? How is that? And that was a good breaking point. Is this <laughs> any better or should it be louder? Let's see. How does it sound to you folks in the comments? More. All right. More, More. please. Wow. Wow. Zoom is so weird. <laughs> I don't know. All right. Thanks, everyone. That sounds good to me. Great. Great. Okay. So that was a really good place to stop because the next thing I was going to go into is I was asked in the registration how I built a community and how we got our start. Well, the bottom line is I wanted to dance more. No one was running regular Victorian dance classes so we could get better and so we decided to run a monthly practice. We kind of prodded folks to stop complaining after the balls while we were out having coffee to about not having a class and let's just do something about having one. 
So we had a small group of friends that said, I'm in. Becky and Denise did the teas and the treats and Karen got us the hall and someone else felt like they could teach the dances and I knew I could promote it. We reached out into the Victorian dance circles and a bunch of folks showed up. The one thing that was important to us was to get to know people in our community and to have time to socialize. Having that tea and the tea time was really important because you know how it is when you go to a ball and you just jump from dance to dance to dance because it's all so exciting and you never really get a chance to get to know the people. And uh, you will see that there is a theme of tea and socializing running through our events and there's a reason. We actually came into English country dance from a bit of a different route than I think most people maybe. Sort of, I say we like to, we slipped in the back door. Uh, it was probably in about 2012 I was looking for more good dance teachers for our dance groups, uh, for our monthly events, <laughs> our group dances. And uh, of course several of the teachers who knew Victorian dances knew Contra and English Country because so many of the Victorian group dances are also Contra Chestnuts or English Country dances such as Boston Fancy and Money Musk. Um, we really just wanted to dance and also we wanted better experiences at the ball so we wanted people to get better about dancing and it was fun. It was just really fun to get together every month and socialize with people that love the same thing you did. It was a funky old church hall but it was cheap which is really really hard to find in LA. We had all recorded music. We never considered anything else because we were small and uh, I didn't even know there were bands that played this kind of stuff at that point in time. <laughs> I think we were there for about two years in the church hall and it was hot in the summer and there was a homeless camp there in the winter where people got to sleep and they had bad broken tile floor. But it was home because that is where we danced. Are you ready for thing two? All right, here comes thing two. All you need is faith, trust, and a little pixie dust. <laughs> uh, we weren't bringing in enough people to make the jump to a new hall, but I knew we had to. I had that inner voice telling me we really needed to do this. I had to make that leap of faith for the hall. So uh, uh, seriously, with knees shaking, we went to have a meeting with the hall manager, Steve Johnson of the Scottish Rite Cathedral. And uh, he came across a bit stern, slightly scary, but he turned out to be a sweetheart of a guy and he was really easy to work with and he, he really gave us our chance because he didn't have to take a chance on us, but he did. <laughs> However, it changed the way I looked at my events because it was a much more expensive haul. I had to sell tickets. So here's some things I have learned along the way and taking a lesson from Alan Winston, I'm going to call them lessons. <laughs> lesson. Promote. It's the business of the dance. I had to get really practical about this. It's the business of selling what the people who buy want, what the dancers want. You need to sell what brings the dancing feet in. People like themes. Themes work because they give you something to sell. Some folks might not want to come out for a community dance every month, but if you are having an Alice in Wonderland tea social or a Jane Austen tea social, then suddenly you're selling extra tickets. And I get the additional fun of designing some promotional materials because I am an art director and a graphic designer. Another reason why themes work is that 10 years ago when I started running these events, Victorian dancers wouldn't go to English country dance events, English country dancers wouldn't go to contra dance events, who wouldn't go to English country dance events, etc., etc. And I just never understood it because it's all historical dance to me and it was all good fun. With the themes, I've been able to sneak in dances from all over the place and folks aren't necessarily aware of that until afterwards. And I believe a lot of folks have expanded their vision of what they are willing to dance or at least try now. And this helps spread people out into the overall dance community. Um, I don't really believe in the concept of competition. More is not 
uh-oh, our audience will now be divided up between two dances. <laughs> more is more. More dancing, more fun, more finding new dance friends, finding new types of dancing to do. I've found that a new dance uh, competition within the community doesn't lessen your audience, but expands it. Uh, more folks dancing is more folks dancing, and if they like one, they will likely find their way to your event too. We've also done quite a bit of public outreach and always advertising our group at every event. Um, oh, I was going to show you one of our calendar cards, but I forgot to grab it. Oh well. And reaching new people is important. I've regularly called Civil War event dances, demo dances at various public places such as museum events and festivals. Whatever might mean more folks coming out to our events, if I could promote, I would. Remember, I really had to sell tickets and get people in the door. And it didn't hurt me that I love the dancing and sharing the joy of it, as I'm sure you all do as well. So, lesson promote. Next lesson, have goals. And as you heard, my number one goal was sell tickets. <laughs> Having goals works. Um, we have annual goals for our Historical Tea and Dance Society committee, such as when we became a 501c3 nonprofit organization. And I have my own personal annual goals every year, such as attending my first dance camp last year at Hay Days. And I swear it's true. <laughs> I wanted to get Historical Tea and Dance Society on the map. Uh, <laughs> I think I managed to do that. <laughs> also, having a known common goal for the society at large gives everyone something to work towards. We really love the Victorian balls, but like I said, folks weren't really getting a chance to know one another, so we decided we were going to be the place where you could do that. So, um, and, and that kind of spread. So our people tend to be, for the most part, very welcoming. We have a greeter at the door. Folks are asked if they are new, if they are willing to wear a ribbon that indicates that they're new, they can, and our dancers will look for people wearing these ribbons. It's not enough to just outreach and get people in the door. Once they're there, you have to make them welcome. And because we have this common group goal that folks embrace because that is what embraced them when they walked in the door, when I'm too busy running the event to be welcoming, I know there are a line of folks who will be there to welcome people coming in. Next lesson, take your ego out of it and check the statistics. Uh, sometimes you want or what you think you want will be great is not what the community wants or is saying that works. You can't do something just because you want to. It has to work for most. Uh, a good example of this is every year we do a potluck tea social and the guests all bring the tea time treats and sandwiches and foods and dessert. And I had this great idea right from the movies. I, we were going to have um, people bring desserts and we were going to raffle them off and whoever won that dessert was going to get to dance with the person that made it and boy did that tank. <laughs> that really did not work out. So, so much for that one. Uh, another key about checking the statistics is that you wind up with formulas of what works and what does bring people in. You know, what made them happy and what they didn't respond to. Jane Austen events and Alice in Wonderland bring people in the door. Other themes, sometimes they show us that they weren't as popular. Lesson, <laughs> get the job done. You can't give lip service and then not follow through. Street cred will get people to buy into the dream and the big picture. You really need to instill trust in the people you work with because they know you do the job and get things done. Someone has to make the decisions. Callers are with calling, musicians with how they play the music. Someone has to make the decisions about how the events come together. Someone has to say, we are going this way or we are doing this thing. And I am, I am happy, very happy to listen to the ideas and thoughts of others. And I regularly talk to people in the community 
about what they like or don't like. And I take a lot of mental notes throughout every event about when people are really smiling and happy, when the mood gets kind of slower. But ultimately, I am the one that makes those final decisions. Lesson. Quality counts. Quality makes folks, people, uh, quality makes people come back. Quality requires diligence and commitment. Um, as you heard in the opening uh, statement about me, uh, I am a Disney girl and I'm always thinking WWWD, what would Walt do? I love the impact of walking into Disneyland or Disney World and everything is done to create that overall like in your face experience. Uh, I have some experience with convention shows and setting booth staging for to create a similar sort of effect for buyers and I really love that and so I kind of brought those two elements forward. Sometimes it's just little touches uh, such as gingham, gingham tablecloths for the potluck tea social and sometimes it's a bit more. For example, um, I had visions of the ideal Christmas carols, Fezzy Wigs holiday ball and as you can probably tell I love Christmas. <laughs> so we created the St. Nicholas Holiday Ball. And we have a little slideshow to show you from that. And as you can thank you Dan for that beautiful video uh, and he did another one there on our historical tea and dance uh, probably YouTube channel and our friends Facebook page uh, you can see we have a running theme of tea and socializing going through our events there is a reason <laughs> um, I think quality also requires ownership what you're doing what you're making it's a creation some folks think the little details don't matter so much, but again, it's that Disney girl in me. I am the person that before the event starts, I am checking the hall and looking at all those tablecloths to make sure they're all even and, and matching. I'm a graphic artist. I know that if there is a small thing out of place, that is what people will focus on. That's the reason we try as a group to make things nice. And I know, I know it makes a difference in people's subjective experience. We try to create a quality experience that also makes guests respond in like kind. And those are some lessons I have learned along the way. Are you ready for thing three, Darlene? I am. Thing three is creating fun and magic. I think Darlene has been talking about that already, but we're happy to hear more. I had a question looking at your video and some of the photos. You have the most amazing costumes. You all must spend days and weeks and months putting them together. Uh, what's it like for your regular events? How, do people dress like this all the time? Oh, well, I'm so glad you asked that because um... We have a, it doesn't always seem it from the beautiful pictures, but we have a long standing policy. Costumes are admired, but not required. They mm. really truly aren't in every event. We have people in regular clothing. Uh, many of us love the creativity of the themes and the costumes, but the real purpose is the dancing and the music and having fun. And the programs are so much fun to create and put together and dance as this overall experience. Um, 
it, again, it's that Disney experience. However, costumes are not required. And in fact, we've heard a lot from people that the fact that they are not required allows new folks to really feel welcome and safe. It's what builds the community. We are always um, reaching out to new folks. And if it wasn't safe for them, they wouldn't be coming back. But I must admit that the reason you see as many costumes as you do is because slowly people start getting that urge. They think, well, it is really nice to dress up. It is really pretty. The only thing we require is at our formals, that, at our formal balls that people wear formal wear, but it can be of any century. So it can be modern, we don't care. Um, this next section is about our events. It, it is the longest, but um, if you stick with me, it'll be really great. Uh, this is probably a good place to respond to the question that was asked on the registration forum. What prompted the change from the name the Victorian Tea and Dance Society to the Historical Tea and Dance Society? And uh, when we became a 501c3 nonprofit, we needed to formalize our name since we were doing so many different time periods and even modern uh, events such as, well, Alice in Wonderland, I guess, technically is uh, a time period, but <laughs> it just didn't seem like it served our group any longer to be limited by the word Victorian. And I, I just knew, I knew we had to change it to historical so it would encompass anything that we wanted to do. Um, as you saw, the magic formula is special events with themes. They create excitement. People get very, we have a lot of people get really excited about what they're going to do for the next one, what they're going to wear, how, you know, even if they don't have a costume, what will they do? We normally have between 100 and 135 guests at our events. And we create about 10 events a year and hold dance classes every week. And I'm going to run through the various types of events we host. It sounds like a lot when you hear all of them stretched out. But again, you know, really it boils down to about 10 events a year. This is just encompassing several years of events that we regularly host. Some every year, some every couple of years. We have tea socials. We host a Sunday afternoon community style dance. It does it is a tea dance so we do have oops, we do have tea lunches and they consist of a lot of beginner friendly dances that build to intermediate dances after our tea time break our first dance is always an advanced dance so that newer dancers can continue to relax while watching and hopefully be inspired to want to learn more about these advanced dances sometimes we have them outside and uh we do Alice in Wonderland, Celtic Tea Social, Jane Austen, Potluck, as you heard me talk about. Every few years we do a Russian Tea Social. We got a picture for that one. Yep. We have balls. Our balls are formal, like I said, but they do not require the themed costume, just as long as you dress nicely. We have a St. Nicholas Holiday Ball, which you saw a clip from. We have a Dance Macabre Halloween Ball, and we have an American Colonial Ball. Uh, and we have George Washington come. It's very exciting. <laughs> we have special events. We have social events which are outside of our normal events, such as our all-day Jane Austen Spring Assembly, which has classes throughout the day. You see a cravat class for the guys and uh, whoever else wants to learn how to create a cravat. Uh, tie a cravat, I should say. We had a headgear. We have food. Of course, we have food. That's our grand dinner with by candlelight. We have uh, dance classes that go on during the day. And then at night, of course, we have our, oh, a little entertainment before our ball <laughs> and just some socializing. Yeah, occasionally we have a moonlight summer ball outdoors and we have a Jane Austen day at the Huntington Museum and Gardens where we recreate a Regency era outing in our Jane Austen outfits. If you have them, you stroll through the gardens or the museums. Uh, last year we had at least 118 for the photo and I know there were more wandering about that didn't make it in in time for that photo. We do a special outreach event every year, the Labyrinth Masquerade Ball. You're going to see a little video of some scenes. 
It's a fantasy masquerade ball that is known across the country. It takes place in the historic Biltmore Hotel in Los Angeles and literally takes over the entire hotel. All the ballrooms are rented by attendees. All three ballrooms, the lobby, the courtyards are all taken over by this exciting event filled with music, dancing, arts, uh, theatricals of all kind for two nights, Friday and Saturday. We run the throne room, ballroom, historical dancing all evening long. And we get to advertise our group to thousands of people every year. We run four weeks of public dance classes leading up to the event where we get to promote ourselves more, where we also teach them waltz and our throne room dances. They're ECD light. I've created several English country dances that mimic courtly style dances for their fantasy outfits uh, and themed in English country and fantasy music. That's my team. We have a team of about 30 people that work throughout the evening and they're out on the dance floor helping new dancers, making sure everybody's having a good time. Um, we need to engage people really quickly and keep them on the dance floor. And we do, they love it. <laughs> As you can see, it's crowded. Uh, we learned what works in order to make folks fall in love with it. And we want folks to come out to our dances after Labyrinth is over. And, you know, some people that are at every single dance class every week come from there. So thank you, Dan, again for a slideshow. Uh, we're posting uh, information about Labyrinth and if you want to see more images. Uh, moving on to from the big dance events. I started slipping in moments before our tea socials so advanced dancers could learn a few more complicated dances that took longer and didn't really fall into the realm of community dance. But I quickly realized if we wanted to dance more and get better at it, we would need to dance throughout the month. That started the dance classes. <laughs> We started with a second and fourth Tuesday dance class for all, and then we started having a half hour of advanced dances at the end of the evening, but we soon realized that wasn't enough. So that started first Tuesday advanced dance class. Then we realized, hey, there's a fifth Tuesday sometimes that happens. So we did special themes. <laughs> Kara King has helped a lot on first and fifth Tuesdays and has been a right-hand person with helping out with calling and programming many of the special theme dance classes, such as choreographer nights focusing on a single body of work like Sackett Friendly or Gary Rudman dances, other themes such as birthday party nights where we dance the birthday person's favorite dances, and occasionally we do random special classes to learn things like Dutch crossing and other more complicated dances. Or if we find out a band is coming into town. And I think there's a picture of uh, some dances we did when Mavish came to town. And you can tell we're serious about our English country dancing from our list of dances. <laughs> and we have a little video. One of my favorite dances. So that left one Tuesday off a month, and honestly, <laughs> the core gang who were more involved in the creation of the dance classes still wanted to get together. We did 
not have a system in place where we could test dances that our community wrote or challenging dances that we wanted to teach. So we started Third Tuesday Dance Kitchen. <laughs> we were so inspired by the concept of the woodshed up in Northern California that we jumped into that. And Alan Winston has promised to come down and work with us once things open up again. Honestly, I guess I just really love English country dance. I wanted to dance all these fun and special dances. I wanted to learn and improve. I wanted my community to learn and improve. And I have been lucky to find a lot of cohorts that wanted to do the same. <laughs> but there is a secret ingredient. You're gonna put up the picture, Lindsay? <laughs> Right down the street from us, within a little distance, we have a cafe that's open till 11 o'clock. So it closes at 11, so we're never out too late, but tea and desserts afterwards at Earth Cafe. It's so important. You have this running theme. We have this running theme of tea and socializing going through our events. There's a reason. <laughs> that that's socializing and getting to know one another has really been a key element. and. Seriously, I would really encourage people to think about how they can bring that into their community if they don't already when we open up again. <sighs> Believe it or not, <laughs> there's more. And I am leading up to the big question about how I started the Five Things web chat. Uh, we started doing tea and dance workshops. I really wanted to get some of these esteemed teachers from around the country in to teach for us. However, we had small coffers. I saw other groups getting them in and kept wondering, how do they do it? And then it dawned on me, we could collaborate with these other groups that are putting on the balls. And I started doing a make it a dance weekend. And you go to the ball the Saturday night, and you come to us Sunday to do a workshop. And so, our people really liked learning about it. We're a pretty new community. We're only about eight years into English country dancing, but um, it's great to learn so much. <laughs> so lesson, I'll sneak one in here, use what is happening. It really worked collaborating with other groups. We've had Bruce Hamilton, as you saw a picture of, Joanna Reiner, Graham Christian. We even got Andrew Shaw because I found out he was coming into Pasadena to do some research. <laughs> and we'll be back with more once things open up again. So that does lead into how all those things lead into how I started the Five Things web show. Um, when life gives you lemons, make lemonade. That's a long-standing policy of mine. If I can do it, I will. I had just built up to 50 students on a Tuesday night in Los Angeles, coming from all over LA County in traffic. And uh, keeping the dance community together is why our Five Things show is on Tuesday night, because that's dance class night. I really didn't want to lose the momentum that happened, and we didn't know what was happening when this all started happening. So I grabbed something out of the toolkit. We had our tea and dance workshop. I knew folks like the tea talk thing and learning about the community as we are a younger community. And we just had Graham out for one of our tea talks and folks loved him. So I really have to say bless you Graham Christian for agreeing to do something we had no idea of what we were doing. I had a concept of five things we could learn about and he said yes, sure. Just tell me what you want. Lindsay is on our committee and I knew she was familiar with Zoom. I did not know how familiar she was with Zoom. She said, yes, I can do that. And off we went into the great unknown. <laughs> um, you should know that I knew very, very few folks in this community. And because of this idea and following my instinct and just taking hold of my nerves and just calling people and asking them, we are learning just how many wonderful folks we have in our dance community. And it's been a gift to get to know everyone, including the attendees in the after talk. Um, sometimes that's some of my favorite things. Uh, we do a couple more online things. Uh, when the pandemic hit, I was worried about people not being connected because at that point in time, we didn't know how to connect. So we started our Thursday tea time. And we are also doing uh, online tea social celebrations where there's a little dancing, a little socializing and fun. 
and um, we even have some historical footwork classes or lectures and there's an upcoming Regency era concert coming on the third Saturday in January so stay tuned for that. Uh, it's such a long list of things. I love it. We had a question from Sharon Green. Let's see, Sharon, would you be willing to come on board now? Let's see if it works. Hmm. Checking the settings here. Paging Sharon Green. Hi, I tried to unmute a couple of times. There were there were some glitches somewhere in the system. Hi there. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> okay, um, my question is a very simple one. Um, it has to do with the fact that you are putting together, running, organizing so many incredible things. Uh, I mean, 27 hours per day is obviously a conservative estimate what can we do as individuals or as groups to help you with what you're doing? That's my question. <laughs> I can't hear anything now. There's nothing. We got it. We got it. <laughs> Darlene, you are muted. Not allowing. Well, that's no good. Allow participants. Well, how about now? Yes. Hooray. Okay. You're there. <laughs> Yay. Oh, I didn't want to shut me up. I just didn't know how bad. <laughs> Don't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, God. Uh, so, uh, how people can help. Well, you know, it does help. The promotion helps because that brings people in. But the thing that is the hardest to do is to get people to help um, in between times, to get people to help during the month. That's when the heaviest workload is. That's not always the most fun because you're not right on the front lines, but it's so needed. There are always um, researching things, uh, sending out emails to people, things like that. If people have time during the week, you know, we had Linda Nelson come in and help us for quite a little while and it was great. And um, you know, that, that really helped. She was sending out emails. It took things off hours of time off my plate. And so honestly, if people have time during the month, I'd say that's the way they could most help with what we're doing. Um, yeah. So I guess that's the short answer. <laughs> Thank you for asking. I can't okay. see you. Love you. <laughs> Love you too, kid. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Thank you, Sharon. It takes a good organizer to know what kind of good questions you can ask another one. Darlene, are you ready for thing four? Thing four. Oops, let me see if I can get this here. When you're home, everyone is family. So Walt Disney said, you can design and create and build the most wonderful place in the world, but it takes people to make the dream a reality. And that's how I feel. It's all the people that make the community. Uh, Karen, who got us our first hall space, Karen Kaler, and Aaron, and Becky, and Denise, and Birgit, and Patricia, who helped so much in the early days, the community of people that have grown uh, sharing and spreading the goals of the group and showing up every month to dance. There are just so many people that really help to build a community. I wanted to create a way to acknowledge some of these people that do so much work in for our group and in our community. So I created the Golden Teapot Awards. It's a way of recognizing folks who have done so much in our community to make events happen. Mostly these are people who are all in and what do you need? No questions asked that get it. Um, I need to give a shout out to Reed Wilson, 
He is the other person who has made historical tea and dance society a full-time job. He does everything from running the front door, hand-making St. Nicholas holiday gifts, bookkeeping, mailings, etc., etc., etc. Dan Vilter, who has helped us so much with sound for our dance classes and how to make that happen easily. Lindsay Verbal, who is running this program with me every week, who you all know and love. Larry Hansen, Kara King, Elvira Klein, who helps with our website, Laura Botak, who has created so many wonderful tea times for us. The two people that take care of me at major events, Katie Musica and Renee Turner, I highly recommend at a major event to have a who's looking after you person. It took me years to feel that that was okay to have, but um, I'm usually so busy running things and doing things, I do things like forget to eat and drink. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so many others in our community. Uh, my unsung hero, my partner Scott Bryant, who is mostly in the background, loading equipment, packing the car, making tea, managing the hall as needed, taking care of problems folks are having, etc, etc. <laughs> the callers who came in early when we had no money and called for us just to be involved in this, building our dance community, and uh, teaching us. Oh, a shout out to James Hudson, Annie Lasky, Judy Pronovos, Tom Wilson, Ginger Alberti, just to name a few. World Peas, Bob Altman, Patty McCullen, and David James. If I didn't have these crazy, wonderful musicians to work with that say, okay, what crazy thing do you want us to do now with music? I would not have been able to create I really would not have been able to create most of our most popular events, the Alice in Wonderland, uh, the Dance Macabre, the St. Nicholas. We have amazing sort of mashed up music that fits into these events. And uh, oh, little shout out to uh, the fourth player in World Peace occasionally, Linda Kader. They have been gentle and kind players who have helped a new caller learn to call with work with musicians. In the early days, um, they got paid so little, but I think they saw how grateful we were to have them, and we fed them and took care of them, and they knew how much they meant to us in our event. Um, yeah, so, uh, by the way, I think I forgot to mention, I'm also a caller. Maybe I did mention. I have to give a shout out to my mentor, Ginger Alberti. <laughs> There's a lovely picture of her. Uh, having a mentor who is good, a good fit for you will make all the difference in the world. Uh, I remember when I was new, I was so nervous. And uh, she finally looked at me and said, you're not going to break them. They will still come back and dance, even if you make a mistake. So <laughs> from there, I just kept boldly going forward and laughing off any errors that came up along the way. Um, the community is so generous. There have been several folks that have been able to make significant donations to our group when they realized we needed them. Someone out there who helped us stay in our hall when the rent literally tripled overnight. <laughs> um, Tim and Gail Steinmeier, who run the Society for Merriment and Manners, who host the Jane Austen Evening Ball, donated a big chunk to help us make our first all-day Jane Austen Spring Assembly happen. It just goes to show if you have an idea or if you want to start a group, don't be shy. Maybe somebody will help or donate funds if you do the work to make it happen. Um, and finally, I wanted to mention that we have a friendship fund. The Historical Tea and Dance Society maintains a friendship fund policy for most of our events. It's like a scholarship. Uh, it allows for folks to attend the event who otherwise could not due to restrictive finances. The, anyone who gets one incurs no obligation and the, all the awards are kept private. Often people will let us know that there is a somebody that might, there is somebody who might benefit from it and we've been able to gift people with tickets to events and funds are raised by our members at large making donations or by various raffles and table sales we have throughout the year. I truly, truly believe that people need to be on the dance floor dancing. It will create joy and help lift up someone who might be going through a bad time. It will make life better being at the dance. I would much rather see somebody at the dance 
and having not, you know, paid the admission to come in the door, it's, it, it you need to do that. <laughs> like I said, when you're home, everyone is family. What a wonderful community you have created, Darlene. It's just amazing, you and everyone else together. And I love the way you take care of each other as well as having fun with each other. It's great. Are you ready for thing five? Yeah. Here we go. Thing five is you. And it was upside down. I love it. <laughs> Watching it float in and out of reality. <laughs> I had to put this picture up. I love this picture. It was not taken at one of our events. It was taken at the Jane Austen evening, but it is our community all gathered together for a group picture. <laughs> People help in different ways. If only by being welcoming, that has been a key factor to building our community. Not everybody who comes in the dance is a major part of the organization of the event, but everybody contributes. So think about your cont contribution. What do you do when you go to a dance? It's important. How do you contribute when you don't have a specific role? The dance needs you. I need you. You make a difference. <laughs> Obviously, I have a whole bunch of helpers. Um, at our events, it's become second nature for folks, or uh, just having watched over time the flow of the event, to start pitching in and removing tablecloths or picking up trash, cups that might be left on the floor, moving tables, whatever it is. And I'm wondering, are you actively participating in the dance? I know that, I really know, sometimes you just wanna come and dance, and that is okay. <laughs> sometimes you've had a really bad day, and you show up, I love that, that's okay. And maybe sometimes you're the person that recognizes somebody is having a really bad day and you just sit with them a little bit and maybe you convince them to come out to the dance floor or not, but you bring a smile to their face because they feel like somebody cared. You can be a good role model on the dance floor, paying attention to the caller, making friendly adjustments for beginners, silently teaching new people how they should behave, modeling actively participating in the dance. Dances work because of the contribution from everyone. Um, I, I'm gonna circle back to the very beginning. Uh, I always love this story. I think about it so much. I don't know if Aaron's out there watching, I hope so. <laughs> but uh, when we first planned that very first Victorian dance class, um, Becky and Denise had all the tea time stuff, the sandwiches, the tea, everything. Somebody was teaching the dances. I promoted it. We walked in the doorway of the hall and standing by the stage was Aaron Jamieson with a boom box and some dance music. And I swear, until that moment, it never crossed my mind that we actually needed to have music to dance with. <laughs> and I'm happy to say that Aaron is still on our committee to this day. So. <laughs> So, uh, um, I started off by talking about the folks it takes to create an event. And if you have learned nothing else from these past few months on this show, you must have learned this. We labor for a smile. We give for the joy it brings because it fills our hearts at times like it feels like it will burst. I tell you again, when I came back to dancing 12 years ago, I was blessed to have the idea in my mind that I should probably do something more to contribute to something I love so much. And it really has changed my life. Um, you may not be the person who plays the music, calls the dances, runs the hall, but you show up and you are here and you have your part. So lend a hand, give a kind word. If you can, please help because there is an amazing amount of work that goes on behind the scenes. Save your complaints or concerns for after the event, during the week, not in the middle of the event, unless of course it's for safety's sake. What we do, we do for love. Um, be present, be active, be loving and giving to your community. To me, you really are my extended family. 
and uh, that's my story. <sighs> Darlene, that was lovely. Thank you so much. I think we've only gotten just a little peek inside of your, your big tent, and you have a lot more to tell us. I, I thought it might be a good time to mention your special request as tonight's interviewee, because it fits right in with the five things. Darlene wrote, take a moment to say thank you to a musician, a caller, an event organizer, a choreographer, a sound technician, or a dance buddy. Please let them know how much their being part of our English country dance community has made a difference in your life. I think that's a lovely request for the end of the year. So I, I will uh, make sure that I follow through with that in the next 24 hours also. Thank you. <laughs> and I also, I'm hoping that you'll consider um, doing some workshop sessions for us at some point. You have a lot of really technical and practical knowledge about not just how to organize an event, but how to be a producer that creates whole communities. Uh, and I think we could learn so much from you. So I, I encourage you to do that. And That'd now you, <laughs> the question that you know that's coming, what is your favorite <laughs> dance or your favorite yeah. tune or both? <laughs> well, you heard my favorite English country dance tune at the start of the show. I love Come With Voices singing. That is certainly my favorite tune. <laughs> and let me couch the favorite dance thing in this manner. Uh, I think our group's favorite dance is Emma Turns 3 because it's on all our major event programs. <laughs> we just love it. And our dance class's favorite dance is Sussex Martlet's Dance to On the Danforth. And we will dance it to just about anything, just for the fun of it. But we really like that one. Um, for me, uh, <laughs> uh, what is the line? I could no more pick a favorite star in the sky. There are so many wonderful moments on the dance floor and that's what it is and that's what it's about. The magic moments of music and dance and company all coming together. Um, I feel like I have to say something or people will be like, hey, she skated out of it. So I have a list of happy dances yeah. and I'm gonna list those. That The first four that came to my mind on the happy dance list is Noel Park, Good Man of Balahi, Goal for the Mayus, and Halsey Manners. Um, I'm going to squeeze in one more little comment because there was no place else to put it. Uh, someone mentioned in a post a few weeks ago, we should have movie soundtracks to our lives. And um, <laughs> English country dance is the soundtrack of my life. I used to listen to nothing but classical for about 10 years. And once I discovered the expanse of English country dancing, uh, it became the thing I listened to all the time. It's the music that saves me. It rescues my soul. It gives me joy in so many different ways. So I have to give them just the most sincerest thank you to every musician out there that's creating the music. Um, makes me want to cry sometimes. So. Yes. <laughs> and Sharon McKinley really wants to know what your favorite tea is. is <laughs> we know that because you're the historical tea and dance society that you are an avid tea drinker. Yeah, and we serve it at all our events. There is no coffee at our events unless Bob Altman has snuck it in in his little thermos. <laughs> My favorite tea is Golden Hunan with cream and sugar mm. uh, it's, and it's a good one it, do you always drink it in a beautiful cup well i have my english country roses Ooh, which, which uh maybe i'll tell you the story in the after talk okay. about the english country roses <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much thank All you right. <laughs> thank you for interviewing me <laughs> this was i look forward to our after talk fun. discussion Thank you for letting me usurp your place here. <laughs> but before we do our thank yous, um, I'd like to invite the uh, insiders here from the Historical Tea and Dance Society to tell us what's coming up in the next week and in the new year. Alrighty, here is our list of various things. So next week, something is, that is not happening is this. We are off next week, happy holidays. Uh, but do keep an eye on the page. We might be posting something uh, instead of our show that night. So stay tuned. Uh, the next show is going to be Tuesday, January 5th. Stay tuned for more details about that. 
and then you can join us for tea time on Thursdays at 5 p.m. Pacific time. We are going to be having tea time this Thursday, Christmas Eve. Uh, it's a social hour or so of friendship and fun. If you are looking for a break in the week with friendly folk, you can join us. You can email us for a link or drop into our Historical Tea and Dance Society Friends Facebook page around 4.30 Pacific time for more details. On Sunday, January 3rd, we have our Jane Austen Tea Social Celebration. Join us as we start off a month-long celebration of all things Jane Austen. It's here in LA, January is always Jane Austen month, and that's what it's going to be for us as well. Uh, we have a little fun, a little music, a little dancing. Uh, if you've not joined us yet for one of our first Sunday events and are a Regency-era Jane Austen fan, then we hope to see you on January the 3rd. They're fun and joyful online events that we host to socialize with our community near and far, Everybody is welcome. Registration is open. The info for that is going to be posted in the chat. Other events that we have coming up, we have on December the 26th, our traditional Boxing Day dance, the day after Christmas. Uh, this year, we will be keeping a good, healthy distance while we still enjoy seeing our friends and folks who don't normally get to join us will be able to join us too. Uh, music will be live featuring Jeff Spiro and Kira Ott. We're going to be contradancing to the calling of Jackie Grennan. It's going to be so much fun. Info for that's in the chat as well. What else do we have? Uh, let's see. Join Historical Tea and Dance Society at 4.15 to 5 p.m. Pacific on the 31st of December when we are having a spot in the New Year's Eve C to C event. Also info in the chat. So keep an eye out for that. So that's the roster of this week to come. I'm looking forward to it all. I hope you are too. All that info is in the chat. You can go back and check on it anytime. We have a Dropbox as well that the chats will be posted to Facebook page where you can visit and review the chat there. So you can find all the information you need. Thank you, Lindsay. You folks have more fun than anyone I know. And this is your, your couple of weeks off, right? <laughs> Amazing. So now for our thank yous for this evening. I want to first thank Darlene and her outstanding Five Things team for letting me interview her and to uh, enjoy her house from a virtual place. So the Five Things team, if you want to bring yourselves on, is Lindsay Verbal and Dan Vilter. We're doing all of the management here tonight. And in the background, we had Reed Wilson on Zoom, Larry Hansen on Facebook, and I think Kara King had her fingers in some of the pies of getting things ready as well. Colin Hume posts an index of all of the web chats and seminars that Historic Tea and Dance Society has done. This one is the 44th this year. Pretty amazing. So go ahead and check them out, especially next week. If there's not anything happening on Tuesday, you can go listen to one you missed. And a big thank you to everyone who's uh, showing up week after week to listen and comment and ask questions. It has made the whole event much more engaging all year to have so many people participating in it. So, and especially, Darlene especially, would like to thank the people who have been sending in donations. Um, I asked her once what her expenses were, and yes, she really does have expenses to put this thing on. And so if you have a little extra in your pocketbook and you can spare some for the Historical Tea and Dad Society, you know they will use it well. Finally, there's one big thank you we need to give tonight at the end of this long 2020 season, and that's to you, Darlene, with your bright entrepreneurial spirit. So it, it turns out, I think, on the last time you danced in your regular class in March, um, you reportedly asked right after the dance, now that you were going to be socially distanced, what is something else that we can do on Tuesday night? Evidence, an organizer never lets grass grow under her feet for very long. <laughs> Your Five Things series was born and it has brought hundreds of us together from across the continent, across the oceans, and each week to learn with each other, share, appreciate each other. You know, dancers don't really have a lot of time to talk to each other. Usually on the dance, you get maybe 32 bars if you're out at the bottom before you're back in again. 
And you've given us the opportunity this time to do that with your meticulous backstage planning, your good cheer, your sincere curiosity, um, and about everything and everybody in English country dance world. So on behalf of your listeners and participants, we thank you for making our pandemic this year a little bit, pandemic year, a little bit more comforting, a little bit more stimulating, and for helping us stay in touch and build our connections while we're away from the dance floor. So thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And I know we're running a little over time here, but as we close, we have a little Christmas thank you gift for you. So um, the person who created it has already gone to bed, so cannot be here tonight. But uh, Dave Weisler has written a tune for you that he has called Darlene's Dancing Mind. And we're going to play it. <laughs> we're going to play it for you in the closing credits. So um, we'll see all of you in the after chat after we've heard the uh, new tune from Dave four times through. So if you want to be in the after chat, the links are in your email. They're on the Friends Facebook page. And um, I guess where else? I guess they're in the uh, window here too. So Darlene, uh, you're welcome to take a little extra time <laughs> to get yourself together before you appear in the after talk. And we hope you'll enjoy it. I think it's a really beautiful tune and we'll be writing a dance to it soon. Thank you everybody and we'll uh, listen to this beautiful tune. <laughs> 